Okay. Hi, Steve. How are you? Good. How are you, Douglas? Good. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to have you here. Thanks for having me. So you got a book called The Uncommon Life of Danny O'Connell, and there's a funny thing on your bio. Did you write these questions? No, the questions? No, I did not. Okay. Because <laughs> the first one says, who the hell is Danny O'Connell? And I got a kick out of that, which... Well, they took that from the uh, the introduction title in the book. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Before we get to the book, though, I just want to ask you a little bit about your your background, your backstory, what you've been doing with your life. Why don't you tell us that first, and then we'll pivot over to your book. Well, my in my professional career, uh, I never had a job. I was a journalist. Uh, I uh, discovered early in life that I liked watching other people work and then writing about it. So for 35 plus years, I was a uh, newspaper reporter and columnist for the uh, San Diego Union Tribune, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the Sacramento Bee. And when I retired from uh, newspapers or newspapers retired from the world, uh, I became more interested in writing books. And uh, so I've written now 10 books all around the theme of some aspect of American history, I think. Okay, I see one title on here. It says American history for or US history for dummies. Yes, I wrote, uh, I've written three of the uh, dummy series, one on US history, one on the Great Depression, and one on the American Revolution. Why do you call it for dummies? Well, that's the, the Wiley does a series of books. It's everything from fixing the, the uh, kitchen sink for dummies to uh, poker for dummies to uh, nuclear physics for dummies. And uh, that's their, that's sort of their trademark uh, title for their series of books on either how to things or why things are a certain way, or in my case, history. Is this the same publisher that does the Uncle John's bathroom series? No, no. Do you know that? They do, Wiley does mostly, they do the dummy series, which is, God, I want to think it's maybe 2,000 titles now. Uh, they do uh, a lot of academic uh, books. They do a lot of textbook stuff. And uh, they do some, I guess what you would say were general reading publications. So this book is about baseball. And who the hell is Danny O'Connell? Okay, I've never heard of him. I suspect a lot of people have never heard of him. Uh, why don't you tell us why he's significant and why you decided to write a book about him? Well, I can I can answer the second question first a little easier. When I was a kid back when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth, um, I collected baseball cards like a lot of kids did. And I would take my allowance uh, every week and go up and buy my baseball card packs. And I'd open the pack and I'd hope I'd get Willie Mays or Mickey Mantle or some superstar. And instead, I invariably get Danny O'Connell. And as a 10 year old, I grew to hate Danny O'Connell because <laughs> I kept getting his card. I didn't know who the heck he was and uh, didn't really care. Um, so you fast forward to a couple of years ago, I was reading a story about the baseball card industry and how it had become a, a financial uh, juggernaut and it had become a vehicle for Wall Street portfolios and people were buying shares of rare cards and cards were selling, you know, in the millions of dollars. And it struck a chord with me and I was wondering about Danny O'Connell and his cards and what they were selling for. And sort of one thing led to another, and I started exploring the life of Danny O'Connell and his career in baseball. And I found a fascinating story there. And that was sort of the genesis of the book. Uh, O'Connell was a major league baseball player, mostly in the 1950s. Um, he was not a superstar, but he was good enough to uh, last for a decade in a industry that most players burn out or lose their jobs after about five years. And part of it was because he was, he had some athletic skills, obviously, but part of it was because he was sort of a baseball genius. He knew where to position himself on the field. He knew how to hit certain pitch that was coming. 
and he did just enough to stay in, in the big leagues and be a very popular and contributing player on the teams he played for. Uh, and it struck me that he was much more emblematic of a baseball player in that era than, say, a superstar was because they just were much more rare. Who did he play for? He started with the Pittsburgh Pirates. He uh, did very well in Pittsburgh, so well that they were poor and they were lousy. So they sold him uh, to the Milwaukee Braves, who were a very good team at the time. The Braves sold him or traded him to the New York Giants. And he was real happy about that because he was a New Jersey kid and he was going to live close to home. And after half a season, the Giants moved to San Francisco. He played for the Giants in San Francisco for a couple of years, and he ended up his career with the Washington Senators uh, in the late, or I'm sorry, in the early 1960s. Back in those days, baseball players didn't get paid very much, did they? Well, they didn't get paid compared to how much players make today, obviously. But Danny O'Connell's career, his probably his, his average salary was around fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars a season. That was about three times what the average American family was bringing in in the 1950s. So it sounds like a lot of money, you know, compared to what his neighbors were making. However, his career was likely to last if he was the average player about five years, which meant at, in his late 20s, or early 30s, he's going to be looking for a new a new job, a new career. And it still wasn't enough because of the moving expenses and all the other price uh, expenses he had to pay that most major league players, when they went, uh, when the season was over, they had to go and get a job in a clothing store or an appliance store, or uh, in his case, he was an after dinner speaker and worked for UPS. So it was a job and it was a glamorous job in terms of getting to play a game and being nationally known but it wasn't real financially rewarding. Well, it's kind of a downgrade too, because you go from that with the fans and the excitement to just a nine to five where nobody knows who you are. Right. Yeah, he was he was fairly well known in his in his hometown of Patterson, New Jersey, and in the northern New Jersey area. But you make a good point. He, he goes from having fifty thousand fans cheering him when he hits the game winning hit or makes a great play in the field to, uh, you know, schlepping Christmas boxes up nine flights of stairs as a UPS delivery driver. Snow covered uh, stairs. <laughs> and snow, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it, it could be, it could be a humbling experience, but I, I think it, in a way it may have made them appreciate much more the, uh, the glory of uh, playing the game during the summer. You mentioned baseball cards. Let me touch on that for a second. I know some of them are extremely valuable. Like you said, they can be in the millions of dollars. And some are probably not worth that much, if anything. Are baseball cards similar to old coins or stamps in, in terms of the value is dictated by the rarity of them? Or what, what denotes what makes a, a card valuable? It, it's, it's partly the rarity and partly the condition of the card. So let's say you have a 1952 uh, Mickey Mantle card. If it's in pristine condition and they grade cards on a scale of one to 10 and say that's a 9.5, you could be talking about $10 million. If it's a two, it might be worth $8,000. If it's a Danny O'Connell card, it's maybe worth ten dollars in average condition and maybe a thousand dollars in perfect condition so rarity is part of it but it's also condition but where baseball cards differ from coins or stamps is that at one point in their life a stamp or a coin had some practical value uh, it you know you you took a coin you bought something with it you put a stamp on an envelope and you mailed the letter when you come to baseball cards, you're really talking about relatively small, maybe three, three and a half inch uh, pieces of cardboard that have no really intrinsic value other than that somebody wants to collect them and is willing to pay money for them. Is, is the value also sort of uh, dictated by how famous 
the player was? Like, uh, obviously everyone knows who Babe Ruth is, but I don't think many people know who Danny O'Connell is. Definitely. There, it, it, the, only, the only caveat to that is if a player is a, an average player like Danny O'Connell, and because of some misprint on the card or because it's exceedingly rare because there weren't that many printed, then it might be valuable. But definitely the player, uh, the player on the card is a big part of the determining its value. Now, however, what's happened in, in recent years, because it's become a speculative uh, hobby, people are putting out a lot of money for unknown players or untried or untested players with the hopes that they're going to go on and become, a, you know, the next Babe Ruth. Uh, I'll give you an example. There's a player named Jason Dominguez, who I believe is now 20 years old. When he was 17, he had played maybe a dozen games at the professional level, minor league level. And one of his cards sold for $475,000 with the owner betting that at some point in the next decade, Jason Dominguez is going to become a superstar and that card's going to be worth a whole lot of money. Uh, there are a lot of examples of that happening where people were just out of luck because the player never lived up to the expectations. Are they still around? I mean, can you still get baseball cards of the current players in the bubblegum packs or do those not exist anymore? Oh, yeah. Bubblegum has been gone for, I want to say, at least 30 years. And the reason why is kind of interesting. Bubblegum had a tendency to stain the back of the card that it touched in the pack. And a stain card lowers the value even if it's on the back of the card. So they don't sell cards with uh, gum anymore. However, there are, uh, I want to say, probably 200 different varieties of cards that are sold by basically three or four manufacturers of baseball cards. So it's, it's a huge industry in terms of buying current cards. Um, and you can buy multiple varieties of them uh, in the in the golden era of, of baseball and baseball cards. There was basically one company. It was the Topps Company out of Brooklyn, and they were the they had the monopoly on players under contract to be on baseball cards. And uh, that's that changed with antitrust uh, rules and some antitrust lawsuits. But there's probably three or four major manufacturers that put out, as I said, scores or not hundreds of variations of card sets. I have to wonder if the cards that are being produced today are going to be worth anything in 50 years. That's yeah, it's a really good question. And it's my guess as a, as a layman in, in, the, in, in the analysis of the industry is no because they're produced in such huge quantities. I, I'll give you an example that I mentioned the 1952 Mickey Mantle card that can sell for 10 or $12 million. At the end of the 1952 season, the Topps company had so many cards on hand, they didn't know what to do with them. So they put them on a barge and took them out to the Atlantic Ocean off of New York City and dumped them. So somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, uh, they're, they've all but disappeared now, obviously, but there were millions and millions of dollars of cards that were just dumped in the ocean because nobody at Topps thought anybody in 1953 would want cards from 1952. That's amazing. Are the Topps cards the most valuable ones, I mean, from that company? Uh, probably in terms of, because they were basically the only manufacturer. Okay. So. Yeah. If you were collecting cards from, say, 1956, you had a choice of a company called Bowman or Topps. But the Topps, in terms of the quality of the cards, the colors, the, the photographs, uh, they were much more uh, collectible. So if, if you're talking about older cards, then you're talking about Topps cards for the most part. Now, if you go back into the 1930s, 1920s, there were other sets of cards that were put out by different companies. And uh, those can be quite valuable as well. Well, Steve, I think on that, we're going to have to wind this down. Uh, the book is called The Uncommon Life of Danny O'Connell. Has the book been released? It has been released. It was released, uh, it was formally released yesterday. And it's available wherever you buy books, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, your neighborhood bookstore. Uh, if your next door neighbor has an extra copy, they'll probably let you have one. Um, but you can buy it 
just about anywhere you can buy books and there's an audible version and also an ebook version and uh you can find it you can either google the name of the book or my name or go on amazon i have an author page there and uh pick it up from there okay last question do you have a website that you want to give out i don't but you can go through the publisher of the book uh, which is Bancroft Press, they have a they can uh, either put you in touch with me or they can help you find out more information about the book. Or as I said, you can go on the Amazon or the Barnes and Noble page and get it from there. Well, Steve, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice meeting you and chatting with you. Best of luck with the book. I hope it does well. Thank you very much, Douglas. I appreciate it.